Hello, my learning friends. We got an oldie but goodie on the learning stove today, and we're going to cook you up some Missouri Compromise because it's going to be on the exam, and you have to know it. That's why. Plus, learning is fun. So what are we waiting for? Why don't we go giddy up for that learning right now and go get her done? Context is key in understanding that period before 1820, the Missouri Compromise, is going to be really key in understanding um, why it comes to be. So previous to 1820, we have the era of good feelings, the decade before, primarily identified because it is really one party in the United States. This is the Democratic Republicans, better known as the Jeffersonian Republicans. And after the fall of the Federalist Party in 1812 at the Hartford Convention, we see really a unification of Southern Jeffersonians and Northern Jeffersonians into this one party, which did adopt some Federalist parties. You had the 1816 Tariff Act and the second authorization of the National Bank. So they're beefing up the central government, but they're not touching slavery at this point, and they're still expanding and allowing slavery to expand. We had Louisiana from the Louisiana Purchase join the Union in this period, and it did come in as a slave state. But there's other problems, and one of those other problems is really kind of uh, the split in the House and in the Senate between Southern and Northern interest. It was pretty evenly divided, although slave states had been on a decline. And what we're going to see is the bringing up of the issue of the Three-Fifths Compromise. Many Northerners feel that this gives the Virginia dynasty or the Southern slave states more power than they're really deserving of because they're using slaves to gain representation. And the Senate is pretty much split as well. So when new states come in, everybody's kind of watching that to see if this is going to upset the balance in the House and in the Senate. You also see the coming into fruition of places from the Louisiana Purchase, which are pressing this issue. Enough people have now moved to Missouri. You had the cotton gin, which made it more profitable to uh, grow cotton in places like Missouri. And you also had hemp, which was a big crop in Missouri, which they wanted to bring slave labor to. But it really is more of an underlying question about whether we're going to follow the Constitution, which is more of a pragmatic document that avoided the issue of slavery and left it up to the states, or are we going to follow more of the spirit of the Declaration of Independence, which the Jeffersonian Republicans in the North are pointing to, which is much more uh, egalitarian, which is talking about, you know, all men are created equal, and, and that's where we should be heading to, so we certainly shouldn't be allowing slavery to expand. But it's going to come to a head in 1819 in the 15th U.S. Congress by a man by the name of James Talmadge, Representative Talmadge from the great state of New York. And what he's going to do is he's going to stir the chicken coop with an amendment to... Missouri coming in as a new state. And that amendment is basically going to require them not to have slavery. And that's what's going to cause all of the ruckus. It actually passed the House, but it's not going to pass the Senate. Actually, some Northerner senators joined against the Talmadge Amendment, which is going to kill it. But it is going to bring to the floor, you know, this issue of slavery and really ripping open some of the wounds that had kind of been uh, secretly hushed away in the corner for many, many years. And proponents of the Talmadge Amendment were pointing to the Declaration. They were bringing up the moral and ethics of slavery, and it really angered Southern legislatures like Representative Howell Cobb of Georgia, who told Talmadge on the House floor that he had kindled a fire which only the seas of blood could extinguish. And he might be right, but not for another 40 years. <laughs> So, maybe you've skipped to this part. What is the Missouri Compromise? It's a compromise which is going to allow Missouri to come into the Union as a slave state. Now, that's going to upset the balance in the Senate and the House, you say. Fear not, my friends, because we're also going to bring in, at the same time, Maine, and that's going to kind of keep the balance. But the ingenious solution is going to be, is ingenious a word? I don't know, but it's not a very smart solution. They're going to draw a line across the map which is going to exclude slavery from from any point north of parallel 3630 north, which is basically an east-west line along the southern border of Missouri. So this is actually good news for the northern states because you have states like Iowa and the Dakotas and Minnesota. You have a lot of land up there that's going to come in free. Um, slave states are going to include Arkansas and Oklahoma below that line. But what that line did not deal with was all of that territory that belonged to Spain at that point that's going to come into the Union 
later as a result of the Mexican War. So it's really just a temporary solution. But that's the compromise that I guess saved the Union, at least for about 40 years. Missouri slave state, Maine free state, magic line to solve all of our problems. So the effects, the last paragraph, may be the most important one. Number one, it's going to postpone the Civil War for at least another 40 years. And in fact, we're not going to deal with this issue of slavery for another 30 years in the Compromise of 1850. We're going to take a whack at it with the Kansas-Nebraska Act and popular sovereignty. But make no bones about it, the Missouri Compromise is going to at least push this issue of uh, slavery in the expanded states and territories um, for a few decades. We also are going to have the end of the era of good feelings. No more good feelings. Those political parties are going to be divided now along that line, and we really are going to get more of a northern party when these uh, Jeffersonian Republicans and ex-Federalists wrap themselves up into the Whig Party and then later the Republican Party. And of course, Andrew Jackson is going to reband the Jeffersonian Republicans as the Democratic Party in the South. But this era of good feelings is over, and now there's going to be conflict that's being uh, really foundated by the issue of slavery. And we also have an incredible precedent to point out, the precedent that Congress is the one that is now dealing with regulating slavery in the new territories. Now, previously, that had happened before. That happened under the Northwest Ordinance of 1787, where they banned slavery in these new Northwestern territories, and it seemed like the South was okay with it then. But that was the Articles of Confederation. This is the Constitution. And this precedent now may be as good for Northerners as they see a lot of Northern states being saved off from slavery, but certainly the South is getting some states as well. But more importantly, now whenever there's a problem over this issue, rather than turning to internal state legislatures to deal with the problem, we're looking to Congress to solve the problem. And eventually when they can't do that, that's going to mean civil war. And there were a few gentlemen back then, and maybe some ladies, who recognized this problem. And one of them was an elderly time. Thomas Jefferson, and we can hear what he thought about the Missouri Compromise right here. But this momentous question, like a firebell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the knell of the Union. It is hushed indeed for the moment, but this is a reprieve only, not a final sentence. A geographical line coinciding with a marked principle, moral and political, once conceived and held up to the angry passions of men, will never be obliterated and every new irritation will mark it deeper and deeper. TJ knew what time of day it was. There you go, my friends. That's the Missouri Compromise. I took it, I kind of crunched it up into a ball of learning, and I threw it through the YouTubes, and I hope that you caught it. And if you want to catch some more balls of learning, check out www.hiphues.com. Go to the video arsenal. We have over four or 500 videos. I've lost count at this point. So other than that, I'm going to ask you one more time. Have you subscribed? If you haven't subscribed, you probably want to do that right now or you're going to break my teacher heart. All right, my friends, I'm going to say it because I say it at the end of every lecture and I mean it with all of my heart. Where attention goes, energy flows. And we'll see you folks next time you press me buttons.